Okay, we're going to jump in. We'll do any Let's go. Stuff. Let's do it. So one of my biggest questions, I was at the march, of course, um, uh, with my partner and kids and so on, and with a you know, million other people there. And I guess one of my, my biggest questions to you is how do you account for the enormous success of it? Mm. Um, I mean, what it was beyond everyone's wildest dreams, right? Mm. And how do you, what do you think? Was it the woman part? Was it the, the moment part? What do you think accounted for it? I think there is a, a combination of things that, um, you know, was necessary to ensure that January 21st was um, a success, right? right. Um, one was, you know, <laughs> Donald Trump is probably the best organizer that right. we've ever had in terms of a motivator for people right. to come together. Um, because the, the truth of the matter is that there were many people who came to Washington or went to Washington because of Donald Trump becoming right. president. That's the reality. Um, we, as leaders, um, would have would have really done a disservice to the movement to allow people to live in that space. Right. We had to encourage them to see past Donald Trump and to also understand him from a historical context that this is not uh, the beginning of something. Right. This is a continuation of sort of oppression that has existed. Um, women didn't just start suffering in this country, <laughs> right. you know, under a Donald Trump, you know, Donald Trump's rhetoric and his presidency. Um, and so, and then there were other people who I think came, they, 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 they went to Washington because Hillary Clinton lost, right? right. So, so you had the Donald Trump won folks, oh my God, what are we going to do? Right. And then you had the Hillary Clinton lost and, you know, women were once again shut out and we didn't break the glass ceiling and all of that. So you had right. a few things happening there. For us, what was important and I think what brought the other elements of um, what you saw together was the whole conversation around intersectionality. Right. Um, being able to bring organizations and people in general together around ideas and ideals that are greater than their issue and, mm -hmm. and, and themselves. So if you are in the reproductive rights movement, the reproductive justice movement, uh, for this particular day, we asked you to be there to support the climate justice movement. Mm -hmm to be there to support the racial justice movement. And those conversations were constant, you know, every day, 20, 22 hours a day right. sometimes, not being able to do calls right. until the middle of the night because that was the time when another <laughs> state or right. another country was available. Um, to their credit, Carmen Perez and Paula Mendoza um, on our team, Carmen was one of the other co-chairs right. or is one of the other co-chairs um, and is also my partner every day. Um, and, and, and colleague in this work, they were responsible for bringing all of the groups, so almost 600 organizations right. and entities signed on to support the march. They were responsible for that, and intersectionality was the word of the day. Everyone learned. It really was. I mean, what it meant <laughs> yeah. to be intersectional yeah. right. in the movement, and it became a sexy word because right. we had to use it like every day, all day long. Right. And after a while, people begin to live in that. Right. That, wow. You know, yes, I'm very concerned about uh, equal pay. But when I look at the equal pay issue, if I'm a white woman, I need to understand that black women and Latina women don't even make as much as me. Right. So they're not just fighting the white, ma white male issue. Right. <laughs> they're fighting, trying to just get to my level. And then we all together are fighting the issue about, you know, of, of equal pay to men. And so, so, so in looking at that, what is the reason? What is the issue? So right. then there's a racial there's disparity a conversation that has to take place. And then once you get into that, <laughs> there's some more onions that get peeled. Right. right. And people had to do a lot of learning. Well, I have to say, I mean, one of the things, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the intersectionality because it really was, I mean, to see intersectionality being now spoken about in mainstream media mm -hmm. is an achievement in and of itself because, of course, you know, we academic feminists have been talking about it for a long time, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's been our watchword for a long time. So, it, it, so let me ask you then. I, I believe there's a woman by the name of Kimberly Williams, I believe her last name is Williams, a black woman, who's also been trying to spread the message within the black community specifically right. about the issue of intersectionality. Yeah, I mean, Kimberly Crenshaw, okay, was, Crenshaw, Crenshaw, right. was, Crenshaw. Kimberly Crenshaw, Crenshaw, Crenshaw was the author of right, the sort of right. term of feminist legal that's scholar, right. was sort of the one who invented it. That's right. And then it's become, you know, it's become everything we believe in. All of us. All of us. Um, 
So if, if intersectional feminism is sort of now the, 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 the ship we're going to sail on mm. um, to make it through these times, what, how do you, what do you see as the next, the next movement of this movement? Mm. You know, how do we get from, from this unbelievable march, and, and by march, marches all over the world, how do we go from there to the long haul? Yeah, and I, I think you know? people, people will still go back into their areas right. and continue to work. But what is important now is that folks have new energy, right? Because there are people who have not been involved in any type right. of movement. They've never been an activist, they've never organized, they've never right. ever marched or any of that and did not even understand the issues. Forget about Kimberly Crenshaw's right. intersectionality right. term. They, they, that's like far. They didn't even understand racism, right. that it still exists. Right. Um, they didn't understand that what they had been experiencing and seeing actually had terms like sexism and misogyny and all of that. Right. So they're getting to learn that in this hour, which is therefore going to and already has uh, sort of drawn people to organizations and other groups and, and, and mm -hmm. to studies so that they can be active participants in a movement. That in, in itself was a major goal of the Women's March. And, 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 as, and not only was it a major goal because we talked about it, the success of it is evident in the fact that, there, that many organizations are saying that there's been an uptick, uptick in women who want to run for office. Yes, I've seen that too. It's interesting. Yeah. So that is yeah. amazing. Because many women didn't think they could. And now we know that not only can we do it, we also did not take any corporate funding right, right to put the march together, which the march cost us over a million dollars right. to pull off what we saw. Right. Um, and we didn't take any corporate funding. So crowdsource funding and some money from organizations, right. Planned Parenthood and others, is how we got it done. And if that's the case, then why can't a woman run for office? Right. Because she doesn't necessarily need the machine to run. Right. She actually can run based upon her friends, family, community supporting her right. to raise the funds necessary to do it, to be the change. Which could also change the machine itself, of which, course. <laughs> which, which, is, which is the machine's right. worst nightmare. Right. <laughs> And what do you think, I mean, as this moves forward, because this is the long, you know, we're all in it for the long haul with this, you know, what do you think is the role of academic and the relationship between sort of academic and activist feminism? There's always been, for a long time, some tensions between that, you know, the world where we write these books and do these journals and the world of activism. A lot of us have feet in both places and have been involved in the movement for a long time, but there often seems this disparity or these, these you know, gaps what do you, what, as an activist mm -hmm. working on sort of, sort of this intersectional feminist leadership, right. what do you right. see as the, what can academics do yeah. to help that process? So I think that, you know, in order to understand, first of all, what academics can do, we have to be able to own issues as it relates to what feminism means right. for some communities, right? right? Because black women do not feel necessarily safe in the mainstream feminism movement never have felt that 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 the white woman's feminism meant that the issues of people of color and women of color were at the center in the forefront of right. it. you know again back to the equal pay conversation right. sexism in the workplace and all of that while yeah we we may we may not be making as much but we're probably more concerned about whether or not our child our children our son is going to be shot and killed by police right. Um, you know, we're probably not so concerned about our reproductive uh, issues when we're potentially facing, you know, being deported or something like that. That's not, it's not our, it's, it's not the same, um, we're not looking at it from the same lens. And so black women specifically for the Women's March did not necessarily feel that they should be there. They, they didn't feel welcome. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because they looked at the history and said that we've been used as the foot soldiers in the past, but have not necessarily been at the center of the conversation and have not seen white women decide that they're going to be as willing to fight marches alongside and, you know, and, 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 and really uh, rush to, to support me, right. you know. And so 
when we talk about that, it's like, now how do we inform like where we've been and then what does this look like now? Because right. feminism is obviously sort of the door has been kicked open. We can redesign what it looks like. Um, I think we did that. We reshaped feminism to include the voices of the most marginalized communities because there were a lot of women that when the march was first in, uh, first announced, they were able to jump on plane, to buy plane tickets. Right. And we didn't have any buses left across the country because right. people who are in positions to be able to do that were able to get together right away. And then it were disadvantaged communities that were left behind. So what we had to do was say, can you ensure that half of your bus is full of people who come from communities that may not be able to afford it? Can you pay for some tickets? Whatever. Right. So there's a historical context right. that truth, I, I believe, and I always say this, that there's power in truth and there's power in just laying out the facts as they are and then trying to figure out how do we piece together and go forward. So I think when you talk about the academic community, perhaps a part of it is just being able to educate women in general, but particularly older um, white women from middle America and other places right. on what feminism is and, and, and no not so much what it is because I, I believe everyone has their own reason right. and, and their own cause within that context but educating them on why there may be a resistance from other groups to get involved right. and to work walk alongside you because that was an issue women's march they were white women who were calling us saying why are these women so angry like you know <laughs> why are they yeah, writing right. these terrible things yeah. and what have you because the history is in the way it's in the way of progress today we saw it you know at the panel <laughs> That's discussion right. we saw a woman stand yes, up yes but what was so important about what your response at that mm. today was and i think the response at the at the march was it's our movement. Right. It's you our know, movement. It's our movement. So the idea that there is there is this thing called feminism that is only this singular thing. Right. Um, and that, in fact, women of color have not been involved all along with mm -hmm. feminist organizing, which women of color have. That, that part of the, right. what, you know, to me, some of the wonderfulness of the Women's March was the refusal by the organizers to accept that storyline. Right, right. So I think, you know? well, for, so, so it's not so much that we didn't accept it because we owned it. We, we got it. We just said, we're flipping it. Like, right. So if, if, if that's how you feel, you, are, you have a righteous concern. Black women called me up and said, you know, we ain't here for it. If 53% of white women who voted in this country voted for Donald Trump, right. we don't need to march. We've been marching. They need a march. They need to have some conversations within their own homes. Right. We went to the polls, 94 plus percent of us did what we were supposed to do. Whether we liked Hillary Clinton or not, we understood that the threat was just too much. So why should we march? We're tired of marching. Let them march. Righteous concern. Right. But the position that I took and that many other women of color who were involved, where, where we stood was that the agenda for the women's march had to include critical issues related to women of color. Right. And it had to be balanced, right? If if not even more of sort of the dis the, the more marginalized communities' voices being pushed to the forefront. Absolutely. And that right. would not have happened had there not been women of color, women with experiences, you know, who can speak to the experiences of um, you know, marginalized communities being a part of the dialogue at the table. Right. And I oh, I often say, not just at the table, but like standing up in the middle of the table <laughs> right. saying, and let me just bring up this issue, that issue, other things, that, other ways that people need to think about it. So back to the question of academ academia and how can the academic community support this newfound movement. Right. It, it really, the educational component is going to be key. Because while we're organizing, it's okay to plan a rally. But then if the rally is not rooted in some understanding, historical context, how, where do we go from here? What traps do we need to be looking right. for? You know, what, what do we, what do we, what do we, what, what should we never go back to? What should we <laughs> never allow right. to happen again right. so that we can go forward? That's only going to come from those who've actually studied movements because... Right. 
the, the downside of people being involved that have never been in movements before is that they think that, you know, you just pop up and pop the shop up right. and, <laughs> and let's go, right. you know, right. and it really right. doesn't work like that because right. when pain comes up, when trauma comes up, when people begin to resist, then you, you could fall apart because right. it's a lot. Right. But if you're in a position where you understand what trauma looks like and you get the history, then you can say, I understand. Right. I hear your pain. And I want to do what I can in this moment right. to ensure that you feel safe here. And, and, and I know I'm not always right, but I'm ready to learn and work together. When you can do that... Right. We can actually change the we world. We can actually do it. Attitude, right? <laughs> and when we don't eat each other alive, you know. Well, I mean, you know, this has been the history of so much of the women's movement and so much of progressive movements for so long of this, in, you know. And, and we saw that. And we're still doing it. We saw a little of that. And, you know, I do think what was great about what you all modeled in this, in this march and the way these marches evolved mm. was a refusal to do that. Right. To take those tough conversations and not have them eat, eat ourselves, mm. but make those tough conversations make us all tougher. Mm -hmm. well, we, so we, so, and, and so just for full transparency, mm -hmm. we went through hell. I'm sure. It wasn't easy. <laughs> It wasn't, you know, it wasn't simple. It was very, very difficult right. and very, very painful because the trauma is there. And it is not just women of color who are traumatized. Right. You know, I had a man tell me yesterday or the other day that if his wife decides to stay home for the day without a woman uh, general strike on International Women's Day, right. March 8th, that he would beat her down. Like, he literally said that to me. And he was a white male. And I thought to myself, even if she didn't want to vote for Donald Trump, she may not have had a choice. Right. She may not have had a choice. I mean, we saw that when, when Donald Trump and Melania were voting, standing together in the voting booth, right. I know you, you, you remember the, the video of him looking over to right. see right. what she was doing. And perhaps he, you know, whatever, just by chance, but based upon right. what this man said to me and then not being able to understand how any large group of people could bring themselves, right. particularly women, to vote for this man, yes, there's racism, there's individualism, selfishness, there's a lot of things that exist, but there also may be some fear. Right. So the trauma came up across, you know, the, so many people, I don't understand why People are talking to me about white privilege. You know, I didn't. I never had slaves. My right. family, you know, everything. It right. was, it, and so, and we had to deal with those conversations right. every day. Or I don't hit my woman. I don't. Yeah, right. I, no, no. Right. Because the right. same man right. that told me that he would beat his wife down. Right. He then said to me, and I respect women's oh, rights. Right. Absolutely. He, sure, he, he respects Well, but they're getting that from Trump, right? They are. Right? He, he I love, my I, wife, I, I, I love the wife I bought. Yeah. Exactly. 